Hey everybody, uh, today you can see that we've got the title on the screen, Arithmetic Sequence. Okay, so Arithmetic Sequence. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is our particular type of sequence. So we've been introduced to what sequences are generically and some vocabulary and terminology. But today what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on a particular kind of sequence. I want you to notice that on this first screen, we have a bunch of terminology again, some notation, but it's all zeroing in on an arithmetic sequence. And so you'll see a definition for an arithmetic sequence at the top. It's just a sequence for which the difference between consecutive terms is constant. Now you'll notice at that bullet point that we refer to that constant as the common difference. And I'm just going to highlight that right there. What we're talking about then is as we move from term to term, there is the same amount that is being added to each term. And so the difference between those consecutive terms is the same every time. And we denote that common difference by a variable of D. So we go to our primary definitions we would use D as the variable. Now, for us to be able to go through and find the common difference, all we need to do is subtract two consecutive terms, and we do it in a very important way. We take any term, and we subtract the one that precedes it, the one that comes before it. So in examples, you'll see down in the blue, if we were talking about subtracting those two terms to find D, to find that common difference, we would take a term and subtract the one that comes before it. So as an example, we would take term three and subtract term two. In the most generic case possible, you'll notice that to find D, we would take term N and subtract term N minus one. And there's how we can denote it in the most generic way possible. Now, that notation would represent, I don't know, term 3, subtract term 2. Or term 20, subtract term 19. That is, we would find the common difference by taking any term and subtracting the one that comes before it. So for us to go through and be able to recognize common difference is a huge part of us being able to address arithmetic sequences. And so let's take a look at the most generic arithmetic sequence we could come up with. What you'll see at the top of the screen now is I just have a little statement that if we represent the first term by A, and that's going to be a very common thing for us as we work our way through sequences and series, that a very common representation in our primary definition is going to be to use A as the first term. In arithmetic sequences, we also now know that we call the common difference D. And so we could represent any arithmetic sequence then as the first term. My next term then would be the first term adding on the common difference. My next term would then be that term and adding on the common difference. My next term would be that term and adding on the common difference. And we could continue that for however many terms there are in that sequence. You'll notice what I just highlighted in my green and red, that purple, could all be simplified. Because within a number of those terms, we have multiple Ds. And so we could collect like terms. And what we end up getting then is the red sequence. So for us to talk generically about any arithmetic sequence, that arithmetic sequence would have a first term of A, a second term of A plus D, a third term of A plus 2D, a fourth term of A plus 3D, and so on and so on and so on. And you'll just see that with our term notation in blue at the bottom. 
Now, you may be able to look at what I just highlighted in orange and see a pattern very particular to us talking about the term number and the relationship of what that general term looks like. And if we can see that relationship that I just drew on in purple, I'm hoping that we can recognize that every term has one less D in it than the term number. Let's skip over term one and let's take a look at term two. Term two has one D. Term three has two Ds. Term four has three Ds. Let's now go back to term one and you'll notice that term one has no Ds. And so what we could write then is the general term for any arithmetic sequence. And we could then say, therefore, term n, any generic term in that arithmetic sequence, has to be the first term plus one less than my term number of d's. And there is my general term for any arithmetic sequence. That is a huge thing for us, and I want you to make sure that you have that clearly highlighted in your notes. To the point where we are going to use that so much, that's going to be memorized. Okay, important for us to know. Term n is equal to the first term, a, plus n minus 1 d's. And that becomes our primary definition or our definition for our arithmetic sequence. Okay, I want to spend some time jumping in and playing around with some stuff now. So let's take a peek. Question one for us just asks, find the first four terms of that sequence. And it's given us the general term. So I want you to pause it now. We'll use this as a little bit of a check to see where we're at with some previous knowledge. So, pause it now, find the first four terms. Okay, we're back. And so, as a little reminder then, I could find f of 1 by subbing in my 1 for my n. That gives me a 4 minus 2, which is 2. I could then find f of 2, which is 4 times 2 minus 2. Replacing all my n's with my term number... I would never have to see any of that purple work. You could just go ahead and do that in your head. Replace your n with 1, you get 2. Replace your n with 2, you get 6. Replace your n with 3, so it's 4 times 3 is 12, minus 2 is 10. Replace your n with 4, 16 minus 2 is 14. Replace your n with 5, 20 minus 2, 18. And I don't even know why I went to the fifth term. The question only said find the first four terms. Well, that was silly. And there you go. So there's us finding the first four terms. You will also notice that that is an arithmetic sequence. We added four. We added four. We added four. Okay, let's take a look at something else, but from a different perspective. In problem two, what I want you to do is I'd like you to go through and find the common difference for each. And so we know from today what we're looking for is D. Now, what I'd like you to do, play around with A and B. Okay, you just work your way through and find D in problems A and B. Okay, pause it now. Okay, we're back. Now, what I want to do is I want to kind of walk through this two different ways. We take a look at problem two, and we should be good to recognize that we are adding four, adding four, adding four. And so we should be okay to state then that our D value is four. But let's just say we can't see it. Like, let's just say for some reason, when we look at that first sequence, 2, 6, 10, 14, we can't see that our D value is 4, the adding of 4 from each term. 
we could go back and use something that we've already talked about today. The fact that my D is always term N subtract term N minus 1. That is, for me to find D, I take any term. So let's say term 2, which is 6. And I subtract the term that comes before it. Term 1, which was 2. I can actually calculate what my D value is. And pretty quickly, you'll just notice, let's say I go term 4. Subtract term 3. If my sequence is arithmetic, then it doesn't matter which two consecutive terms I choose. If I subtract them in that order, the term, subtract the term that precedes it, I can calculate my D. I would hope for a lot of us, you're just looking at the purple, you're seeing the pattern, and we're stating the red. Now, why do I bring that up? Because there could be a pretty common mistake. That is, if we ignore order, then you may end up looking at that going, hey, like, they're three apart. Every single term is three apart. And we may make the mistake of saying D is three. But we have to make a note that what we have here is we are going down three from each term, then down three. And so my D value happens to be negative 3. If we were to calculate it and say that my D is any term, subtract the one that comes before it, then you don't make that mistake. I would hope we wouldn't make that mistake anyway. But using that definition for finding D can be helpful at times. Okay, I'd like you to go through and try to figure out what D is on the sequence given in C. Okay, pause it now. Okay, we're back. So, as soon as we went to fractions, I have a feeling that some people found that a little more difficult. And so maybe the idea of what are we doing to go from term to term wasn't so obvious. So what could we do? Well, maybe we go back and we say, okay, I'm going to go D and I'm just going to calculate it. I'm going to take 17 halves and I'm going to subtract the number that came before it. Or maybe you took 7 and you subtract the number that came before it. Or maybe take 11 halves and subtract the number that came before it. Any combination. You doing that now goes, hey, I need a common denominator. And so... When we take our 17 halves and we change 10 into halves, we can now calculate that we are decreasing by 3 halves every term. Okay, maybe we don't want to do that every time we get a sequence that has fractions in it. And so my suggestion to you, if you wanted to do the purple and just find the pattern is maybe when you see that you have some terms with fractions and others that don't, or they're all fractions, rewrite the sequence out in your common denominator. So if I was to see problem C on an evaluation where it's already printed on my page, I may be tempted to go, well, I'm going to change 10 into 20 halves, I'm going to change 17 into 14 halves and I'll write right over it on my problem. I can now see that to go from term to term, I am decreasing by three halves. The only thing to be very careful of is sometimes people will zero in on the top of that fraction and they will see that you are going through and you are decreasing by three. And then we forget about the fact, no, no, it's three halves. So just be very careful on that. We get another little confirmation. We're doing the same thing here and decreasing by three halves. And so you could have come up 
with that D value of negative three halves without doing any like formal calculation, let's say, like what you see in blue. Okay, you being able to come up with or find the common difference is going to become a huge part of dealing with arithmetic sequences. Now what I want to do is I want to take a look at some problems where we're actually going to come up with the rule or the general term for these sequences. Let's take a peek. What you see on the screen now, problem three, I've given you the first four terms of an arithmetic sequence. And what I would like you to do is to come up with term n, that is our general term, our rule, and then we're going to find a specific term in that sequence. We're going to find term 20. Now, I also want to be very clear that when you find term 20, we should not be counting out terms in that sequence. That you would need to be prepared for me to ask a problem like find term 2000. And if you were going to sit there and count out what all those terms were in that sequence, you're going to be here all day. So we need to be prepared then that even though I've chosen to find term 20, a relatively small term in that sequence, be prepared to find anything. Okay, let's take a look at A together. Earlier on today, we discussed that we came up with the general term for any arithmetic sequence. Now, because the problem told us that it was arithmetic in the problem, we could now make the assumption, okay, so therefore, my general term, term n, I know is always a plus n minus 1 d for any arithmetic sequence. Okay, let's say the problem did not tell us that it was arithmetic to begin with. Then it would be important for us, necessary for us, to go through and figure out, well, what type of sequence was given. So what we're going to do then is we're going to look and see how do we move from term to term. And we may notice that we went up four, then up four, then up four. And since I am adding or subtracting the same amount from term to term, therefore, yep, it is arithmetic. And if it's arithmetic, then I know that any term is equal to the first term plus n minus 1 d's. You may start to look at that blue general term as almost like a formula now. And it's often referred to as like the formula for an arithmetic sequence, the term of an arithmetic sequence. I would hope that we would just look at it as a relationship. We built it. We understand why it is what it is. And so now let's just use it. You can see within the sequence that your first term is 3. And therefore, A is 3. Because definition is that A is your first term. You just found out that we went by adding 4 from term to term to term. Therefore, you found out that your D was 4. Just sub everything into your general term. And so what we end up getting then is term n is going to equal 3 plus n minus 1 times 4. Now, you'll notice that I put brackets around that 4, and I just do that out of habit. I would not have to put brackets around that 4 at the end because you can already see that my two terms, n minus 1, times my one term, 4, that multiplication is still maintained because of the brackets around the n minus 1. I just put brackets around that 4 out of habit because there will be times where I need to put brackets there. You may find, hey, it's just easier to always put brackets around that d. Okay, there is my general term. The only issue is it's not simplified. So let's go ahead. Let's expand those brackets. You get 3 plus 4n minus 4. Now we can collect like terms. 
and you come up with your term n or your general term being 4n minus 1. There's our rule. Now, if there is ever a time where you're unsure, let's say you're working through an evaluation and you've got some time over on the end to be able to check your answer, I would absolutely pick a term in that sequence and sub it back into that general term and make sure it matches up. Like maybe you go up and you see the last term that's there, term four. So you say, well, I'm going to check. And so I'm going to find term four, which means I replace my n with a four, calculate it, 16 minus one is 15. I look back up and I see, hey, term four is 15. Perfect. Then I know my general term is correct. Or at least at the very least, I'm very confident that it is. Okay, I'm just going to get rid of that because I don't want us to ever think that that is a required part of our solution. However, if you look back up at the problem, it says that we have to find term 20. So now I can use my general term to find term 20. I can use my general term to find any term in that sequence. I do that by replacing my n with 20. That gives me an 80. There's my 80 minus 1, 79. And now I've answered both parts of the problem. I came up with term n, and I came up with term 20. Okay, there's a process for us that we can almost turn into an algorithm. Can we duplicate it? Can we do it enough times to be super comfortable with it? Okay, what I would like you to do, take a look at the sequence I gave you in B. It's going to be a little uglier. I'd like you to take a shot at going through and finding what term n is and then what term 20 is. Okay, give it a shot. Pause the video now. Okay, we're back. So if I was to take a look at B, same thing. Problem says it's arithmetic. I need to find my A, I need to find my D. Well, I can read my A from the problem. It's 4. I need to figure out what my D is. And so, I notice that I have some fractions. If I was then to go through and say, well, I'm going to write all of those values with my common denominator, then 4 is 8 halves, 3 is 6 halves, I should be good to see that I am going through and subtracting a half from term to term. Okay, my general term, term n equals a plus n minus 1d, I'm going to use that so many times, I'm going to write it down every time to drill it in. So term n is equal to a plus n minus 1d. And now I could sub in all the particulars, the specifics of that sequence. I can replace my A with 4. I can now sub in my D as a negative 1 half. And you may now see why I said last time, I always put brackets around my D. I'm going to erase that for a second just so that you can see why my brackets are necessary. If I just wrote negative one half, you'll see now that looks like a subtraction operation. I've lost my multiplication operation. Put brackets around it. I have now maintained my multiplication. Okay, we got to simplify it. So now we can expand those brackets, collect like terms. There's my 4 minus a 1 half n plus a 1 half. We should be okay to say that that is a negative 1 half n. And if I take 4, that's 8 halves, add on another half, then that gets me up to 9 halves. Please make sure that you get comfortable working with fractions. Fight the urge to want to turn those into decimals. If I gave you something like a common difference that was negative four-sevenths, all of a sudden changing into decimals doesn't work, you're going to be rounding. 
So we want to make sure that we get comfortable working with fractions. Okay, now that we have that, we should be good to be able to go through and find term 20. So if I go through to find term 20, then that means I can now sub in 20 for n. It's nice, that cross reduces. However, if I look ahead a little bit, I might be able to see I'm going to want a common denominator anyway. So to actually simplify it, but not fully simplify it, and leave it as a negative 20 halves might actually make my life easier. And you'll notice in this case, it does when I now go through to simplify, I already have my common denominator. So I get down to a term 20 of negative 11 halves, and I have now answered the instructions or followed the instructions. Okay, you want to get really good at being able to find a general term and then a specific term within an arithmetic sequence. What I want to do for the rest of our time now is actually start working our way through, I don't want to call it quirky situations, not quirky at all, but I want to start looking at all the different angles and all the different perspectives we can take when dealing with arithmetic sequences. So let's take a look at our next one. You can read the problem in problem four, and you'll notice that we've been asked to do something different. That I've given you a full sequence, and you can tell that it is a full sequence because we have a period at the end. That means that that sequence does not continue on. Had it continued on, then we would have seen our dot, dot, dot. And so for us, we know that that sequence terminates at that term 119. So this problem asks us to find the number of terms in that sequence. So we need to know how many terms exist in that sequence. Just as before, do not get comfortable trying to answer this question by simply going, hey, well, I know that the next term in that sequence is going to be 29, and then the next term in that sequence is going to be 35, and then the next term, and you simply count. I am telling you that on your evaluation, you will have to give me an algebraic solution. Or I'm going to put so many terms in this sequence that you're going to be sitting here counting all day to figure out. You're going to run out of time. So what we need to make sure that we are comfortable in doing is being able to find an algebraic solution to this problem. Okay, so let's imagine that this is a stumper problem. And it should feel a little bit like a stumper problem for you. We haven't tackled a question like this before, a problem like this. And so how would I stumble my way through this? Well, the problem says determine the number of terms in the arithmetic sequence. And well, the problem tells me that it's arithmetic. And hey, I know something about arithmetic sequences. I know that a general term for them is a plus n minus 1 d. Well, I could start there. Okay, well, I'm sure, not sure how that helps me, but at the very least, I could sit there and say, well, I can tell that my first term in that sequence is 5, so I know that I have an a value of 5. I can also tell that I'm increasing by 6 term to term to term, and so I could tell that my d value was 6. Now, I'm going to erase that last part that I just put on because there is something that might not come so naturally to us that I want to make sure that we're good in seeing. If I was just to write my term numbers above each term in that sequence, that is that 5 is term 1, 11 is term 2, 17 is term 3, 27 is term 4, that I don't know what number 
term number 119 is, so I may just call it term n. That maybe you can see in that blue above each term in the sequence, that for me to answer the question, determine the number of terms in the arithmetic sequence, that I could actually answer this question if I knew what term number 119 was. Take a look at the beginning of the sequence. If the sequence was only 5, 11, 17, 23, and it stopped there, notice 23 is term 4. And so I could have drawn the conclusion then that there were four terms in that sequence. And I would have been correct. So what I'm really looking for is what term number is 119 in that sequence? And so really what I also know then, that term n is 119. And so if I subbed all of that information back into my general term, 119 is the term in the sequence that has a first term of 5 and a common difference of 6, that that actually creates an equation for me that has just an n. And what that equation is actually going to allow me to solve for is what is the term number that would apply to 119 in that sequence. And so when the question asks me to determine the number of terms, I can now just solve my blue equation and I can now answer the number of terms problem. Now, if there's something that I can help you with in terms of strategy, it might be this. We may have built up an experience like an instinct over the last couple of years of the I see brackets, I expand. And I'm going to maybe try to break that if we have it. The reason for it, <clears throat> I think what I would do is I would get rid of that five first. Now, if I get rid of that five first and I can subtract a five from both sides, that leaves me with a six times n minus one. No, I'm not going to expand the brackets now. That because that 6 is multiplied by the whole right side, I'm going to divide it out right now. Now, in your other experiences, sometimes dividing out that 6 would have given you a fraction. So now when you go to solve for n, you'd have to get a common denominator, and you go, ugh, that's a pain. So why don't I just expand in the 6? I want you to think for a second about what you are solving for. In this equation, you are solving for n. And remember, n is the term number. Can I have a term number of 13 halves? Can I have a term number of 65 sevenths? No, that within our general term, our n has to be a natural number. It has to be a whole number that's positive. I can only have whole numbers that are positive as a term number. I can't have term 5.6 in a sequence, not term number. So, when I take a look, this divide by 6 that I'm about to do has to give me a whole number. It must. If it went to give me a fraction, then I know I made a mistake. And so, I'm going to use this method to go through. Now, yes, it does mean that i got to divide a decent number, but we should be getting better at maybe some of that short division. When I go to divide out that 6, I'm going to get 1 14 sixths, 
but I want to reduce it right away. So my 11 divided by 6, well, 11 divided by 6 one time with 5 left over. Put it together with the 4, 54. 54 divided by 6 is 9, and I now simplified it. I got a whole number which tells me that I'm correct. Now all I have to do to solve for n is get rid of the 1. And I actually found out that there's 20 terms in that sequence. If I went back up to that problem, I just found out that term 20 is the term 119 in the sequence. And therefore, the number of terms in that sequence must be 20. Okay, there was a decent amount of stuff that we talked about in that problem, but I just want to kind of go back to the beginning and say, I stumbled by using my generic term, my general term. Then I just took the particulars of the sequence, I subbed them in, and hey, I found an equation I could use to solve. I think a good instinct for us is to use general terms and use our basic definitions to be able to solve problems. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, we take a look. I've asked you to determine term 20 in the arithmetic sequence where term 5 is 27 and term 9 is 43. Okay. I want you to go ahead and try to solve this one on your own. So, you have to determine what term 20 is in the arithmetic sequence where term 5 is 27 and term 9 is 43. Okay, I want you to give it a shot. Pause the video now. Okay, we're back. So, if I was just to write out a little bit of information within this sequence, just to give us maybe a better perspective of what it says, it would say like, you know, we've got term one, we've got term two, we got term three, we got term four. Term five would be 27. Term six, term seven, term eight, now term nine, 43, and so on and so on. Just to give us a little sense of what this problem actually represents. Okay, same thing as I spoke before. We have to make sure that we're not counting spots. We have to be prepared to be able to solve this for terms that aren't four terms apart. Okay, if I was to stumble my way through this, I could at least say, well, I know how to represent a general term within an arithmetic sequence because I know term n is equal to a plus n minus 1d. And then I could sub in the relevant information. Now, what I'm really hoping is, if I just get rid of my general term information, we can actually go back to our basic definitions, our a and our d's. And we might be able to say, like, pretty quickly, that if I'm looking for term 5, then I know that that has to be an a plus 4 d's, one less. And you'll notice that's just me subbing 5 into our general term. And that term 5 is 27. Now, that allows me to create an equation that has two variables in it, which means if that equation is going to be really useful to me to enable me to solve for things, I would need another equation with the same two variables. And if we look at the other piece of information given, we're told term 9 is 43. Well, term 9 must be an A plus 8 Ds, and that has to equal 43. And you'll notice pretty quick, we just built a system of equations. So even if I just stumble through that problem, I can get to that point. Now, if I was going to use those two equations to solve, I have equation 1, I have equation 2. I would hope everybody was going to use elimination to solve. You guys should be good to go.
So to work our way through and solve that system, I'm going to ask you guys to get a little systems practice. We're going to be doing a lot of it this unit. Let's go through and solve that system. Pause the video and we'll come back and we'll check and we'll see how well we do. Okay, solve the system. Pause the video now. Okay, we're back. Um, I would hope again that we would use elimination and probably take equation two and subtract equation one. That will cancel out my A's. That would then give me 8D minus 4D, which is 40. And 43 minus 27 is 16. And I could now go through and solve for D. So there is me going through and using my basic definitions for arithmetic sequences. And that allows me to build a system to be able to solve. Now, I would have some other people that would take a look at the uh, sequence that I have in purple. And they may have gone through and said, well, for me to go from 27 to the next term, you'll see I wrote my arrow in green, I would have to add on a D because it is an arithmetic sequence. And then I'd have to add on another D and then I'd have to add on another D and then I'd have to add on another D. And you may end up building the equation that 27 plus 4 Ds equals 43. Notice that gives you one equation with one variable. You could now solve. And this is just a different way for solving for D. Now, I would argue... I think your system way is the most generic way to get there. I think it is the best way to get there because it will always work irrespective of how ugly the numbers get. I don't think you would look at the given information in the problem and if I was to give you two terms that were farther apart that you would draw individual Ds and just go add another D, add another D. But instead, you would take a look at those term numbers. And so I'm just going to delete all that marker that I have around there. And you would be able to say, based on term 9 down to term 5, that those are four terms apart by just calculating your 9 minus 5 to give you 4. That's what enables us to determine 4 Ds. I do think, again, the system way is just the easier way to get there, and especially if you're really comfortable solving systems. Now, the other reason why I maybe like a system is because the question asks you to determine term 20. And maybe what you do is you then follow along with the green, and now to get to term 20 from term 9... That would be 11 more terms or 20 term 20 from term 27. I guess that would be term five, I should say. That would be 15 more term. You could go through and do the green again. However, I might argue that once you found D in your system, you can now just sub D equals four back into one of the originals. And I'm going to pick the easiest equation, the one with the smallest numbers. That now gets me my A plus 16 equals 27. And so my A equals 11. I have now solved for my general term that it is 11 plus N minus 1 times 4. That now to go through and find term 20 is really easy for me. It's just 11 plus 19 times 4. And so if I multiply my 19 times 4, then that's a 40 and another 36. There's a 76. And that gets me 87. I like the system way of solving. I think it is most generic, and I think it can become a pattern for a lot of us. Plus, it gives us extra practice at solving systems, which is a great skill we need to have. However, you can work your way through an algebraic solution by doing the green. Just make sure that you answer the question that's asked. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, you can see from the problem on the page 
How many multiples of 5 are there from 20 to 200 inclusive? Now, I would just want to give a brief kind of make sure that we're all good with what the term inclusive means. Inclusive means including the ends. So if I were to write out what that sequence would look like, it would start at 20, not the first multiple after 20, but it would start at 20, then go to 25, then 30, then so on, all the way up to 200. Inclusive means that we would count both end values, the 20 and the 200. Okay, what you'll also see that I've done in purple, I would suggest doing that every time you're not given the sequence. It takes you 5, 10 seconds, but to write out what that sequence is, I think is really helpful. Okay, now that we fully understand what the problem's asking, I'm going to give you a second to try that one on your own. Okay, I want you to pause it now and give it a shot. Okay, we're back. You may have noticed that by tackling the problem this way, you've actually made this look like a previous problem. Because we have that period on the end that our sequence terminates there, really all we need to figure out is, what term number is that one? If we can figure out what term number 200 is, then we are good. And so my general term, and again, I'm just going to write it down to drill that in. My term would be 200 for my term n. If I can figure out what term number that last term is, then I know how many terms are in the sequence. It is a sequence that starts with 20 and has a common difference of 5. If we're talking multiples of 5, then all the numbers in that sequence are 5 apart. We could go through and do the same process we did before. Let's get rid of the 20. Rather than expand in the 5, let's divide it out. 18 divided by 5 is 3. With 3 left over, bring down the 0, 30. 30 divided by 5 is 6. And now we can solve for n. And I don't know why I wrote down a 7. It should have been a 37 for us in terms of our terms. So how many multiples of 5 are there from 200 to 200, sorry, from 20 to 200 inclusive? Therefore, there are 37 multiples of 5. Okay, hopefully this is starting to come along. It's starting to feel more comfortable as we go. Let's tackle one more. Okay, you can see from the problem given, determine the value of x such that x plus 2, 2x plus 3, and 4x minus 3 are consecutive terms of an arithmetic sequence. So again, we see that it is an arithmetic sequence. Now, I want to walk through something like this because I think that there is an absolute trap in this unit. And the absolute trap is that we always go to our general term. And you'll notice that two problems ago, I tried to get you away from that a little bit and just to think about basic definitions. That if I was to go with that general term and I start to now go, okay, so like my first term is an x plus 2, so I can sub that in for a. Um... It doesn't say how many terms are in the sequence. It just says that those are three terms. There could be more. So I don't know how many numbers of terms are in the sequence. So I can't really do much with that n. What's my common difference? Well, you might start to look and say, what do you do to go from term to term? That might be a little difficult to see, but then you're going to plug in, well, my x's are changing, so at least I know I'm going to have some x's in here, that all of a sudden we start to build this really ugly looking equation. 
And our blue general term might actually be a bit of a trap. My suggestion to you is that when you feel you're getting into a situation that feels a little different, like it's not an automatic plug in an A value, plug in a D value, because you can determine determine both of those. But if it's something that feels a little weird, a little different, then you go back to your base definitions. Remember, A is your first term, D is your common difference. A, we can always read because we can just read it in the sequence. But if you recall, D is always the difference between your terms. So I really want you to give this a shot. So try this one on your own and it is well worth the problem solving. And then we'll see where our instinct takes us. Okay, pause it now. Okay, we're back. So here's what I was talking about in terms of definitions. I'm just going to erase the A and D. And if we were to look at this as if it was just a generic sequence, then we may say, well, what do you add from the first term to get to the second term? And we notice that we add one more x and one more as a constant. But then when you go from this term to this term, it looks like we add two x's. And then we subtract six. That those don't look the same at all. And I'm going to argue to you, what you have in green is super useful. Recall that these terms contain unknowns. So it just means we don't know what x is. But if we knew what x was and we replaced those x's with a constant, then whatever numbers lay in those positions would form an arithmetic sequence. So it's not so much that we look at these two expressions here and we go, oh, they're not the same. Like once we found the first one to be x plus one, then the second one should have been x plus one because it's the same amount. As soon as there's a variable in there, variables can change. We're not focused on having the same expressions, but we do know something very important there. I'm going to just erase that underline, but I want to leave that green there. And when I had mentioned about going back to your base definitions, one of those important definitions could be that for us to find a common difference, we take any term and we subtract the one that precedes it. That if us getting those green expressions wasn't common, then we could always calculate it, or at least feel like we're calculating it. That is, I could take term 2 and subtract term 1. And so, if I was to do that, I'm going to now take 2x plus 3 and just make sure that when we are subtracting two terms, we make sure we subtract all of it. And you notice you'll get your 2x minus an x and your 3 minus a 2. And there is another way that we could get to that x plus 1. I just determined my D between the first two terms. Well, we could do the same thing in the next one. If I was to do my red and I wanted to find my D, then maybe I take term three and I subtract term two. Well, term three would be four X minus three, subtract all of term two. I'm not gonna make the mistake and not think of that with brackets. That now, I could take my 4x minus 2x, and I could take my negative 3 subtract positive 3 and get to there. Notice a different way to come up with that 2x minus 6 difference. Okay, what's the whole key to this problem? It's this. That when you found x plus 1 is the difference between the first two terms, and then 2x minus 6 is the difference between the second two terms. Because it is an arithmetic sequence, we know that those two differences have to be the same. You can see it in what I just circled in green. They're both equal to D. I could jump then and say, therefore, 
x plus 1 has to equal 2x minus 6. Now, if jumping to that point gets a little confusing, well then just keep in mind that what you have is d equals x plus 1 from the first and d equals 2x minus 6 from the second. We could just say that's equation 1, that's equation 2, and sub equation 1 into equation 2 and come right in on that green. I don't need to see any of that algebra. I think we should be good to draw that conclusion in the green directly. Now that you have that, you have the easiest of easy equations to solve. You have x equals 7, and you have now answered the problem. Problem said, determine the value of x so that those are consecutive terms of an arithmetic sequence, and you just did that. I think you're silly if you have time after solving that problem not walking away and checking. Like even in your head, do a quick substitution back. Like in your head, sub x equals 7 back into the first, the second, and the third, and just make sure that those become consecutive terms of an arithmetic sequence. That is, sub in your 7, so we get 9. Sub in your 7, 14 plus 3. Sub in your 7, 28 minus 3. Do a little check. 8 apart, 8 apart, you know you're good. Now I am super confident that x equals 7 was our solution. Okay, we've gone through a bunch of problems today. From figuring out what the heck an arithmetic sequence was, to building general terms, to looking at common definitions, what creates them, finding specific terms in a sequence, and then finishing off some problems that were a little quirky, let's say, ones that were a little different. Your job now, jump in and get some practice and make, these, make this as automatic as possible. Okay, good luck.